Telecast, the TV industry news review. Hi, I'm Justin Crosby and welcome to this week's Telecast. Coming up on this week's show, we're looking at the Korean TV industry with Diane Min, head of format sales for one of the country's leading broadcaster producers, CJEMM, and non-executive director of K7 Media, Claire Thompson. This week's show is sponsored by PR Buzz. TV. COVID-19 has changed the game for many TV producers and distributors. Production stopped, physical markets gone. So now it's more important than ever to build your business and sell your shows to content-hungry broadcasters and streamers all around the world. But how do you make your show stand out from the thousands of hours of content competing for buyers' attention when everything is virtual? And how can you hire the best PR consultants when you can't afford a retainer? Well, we've got the solution. PRBuzz.tv PRBuzz.tv is the new press release service from Boom PR to get the content industry talking about your shows ahead of this year's MIPCOM. No PR retainer. No inexperienced PRs who don't understand your business. Just a flexible, premium, press release service with three price options to suit your budget, delivered by experienced PR professionals and former TV journalists who understand the content industry, the media, and what makes a news story. Book your chosen package at prbuzz.tv and sit back and relax as we craft your press release in the format the media wants, distribute your story to the world's most influential TV journalists, and send you your coverage, collated with all your clippings, into a digital coverage book. And what's more, we offer a unique no-coverage, no-fee guarantee. That means if we don't generate any articles for your new story, we'll refund your payment in full, within 24 hours. No questions asked. And telecast listeners can get a special 10% discount on all press release bookings before 16th of October using the code TCMIPCOM. That's TCMIPCOM. Go to prbuzz.tv and book your free Zoom consultation with us. And let's help you sell more content. So my first guest on this week's show is Diane Min. Diane is Head of Format Sales at CJENM, overlooking non-scripted and scripted format distribution of CJENM's 16 cable networks. Since 2015, Diane's led format sales and completed more than 30 deals globally for shows including Grandpa's Over Flowers, otherwise known as Better Late Than Never, to NBC in the US and 10 other countries, and also I Can See Your Voice, which she sold into 12 territories to broadcasters including Fox in the US, BBC One in the UK, RTL in Germany and RTL4 in Holland. Prior to CJENM, Diane worked at Cartoon Network Korea in kids programming. And joining Diane is Claire Thompson, non-exec director of K7 Media. Claire regularly writes and presents on global content trends for their international broadcast and production clients and festivals around the world. Alongside this, she runs development and pitching workshops team training sessions, and channel commissioning strategy projects for clients including the BBC, Channel 4, ITV Studios, and Endemore Shine, plus Chinese broadcasters including CCTV, Jiangsu, and Shanghai Media Group. She also consults on the development slates of several indies in France, Ireland, and London, and in Scotland via the Screen Scotland Focus Scheme. Welcome to the show, Diane and Claire. Hi. Hello. Wonderful to have you guys on the show this week. I've been really looking forward to learning more about the Korean TV industry. Claire, can we come to you first? Tell us a little bit about your role at K7. And I I gather you've been doing some Korean research and showcases and, and reports recently. It's lovely to be on the show. Thank you for having me. I have been working for K7, I think, since about 2014, 2015 now. And I sit on the board uh, of the company. But then I also write the monthly entertainment and reality reports on sort of what's happening around the world. Um, normally, I kind of choose three 
themes uh, and talk about what's sort of interesting in those in those three areas. And then I do lots of presentations to all of our big broadcast and production clients, so Sony, Fremantle, Warners, and so on, about what's top, basically. Um, often those happen normally in what we'd say is uh, pre-MIPCOM or MIP. Obviously, things are slightly different this year, but just giving everybody updates on what's happening. And then I do regular insight reports, which are we just pick a topic on something that we think is sort of very interesting at the moment. And I've just finished writing one actually about um, co-production. So between East and West in particular, because of all the activity in in Asia, in, in Korea particularly, but also China, um, Thailand, Philippines, other places now, and partnering up with, with Western companies. And then uh, I did a report at the beginning of the year on K format specifically. Uh, and I've been doing lots of these now virtual showcases. So BCWW, which is the regular broadcast worldwide conference that usually happens in Korea, all happened online this year. So um, showcasing some of the latest Korean formats on that um, a couple of weeks ago. You're the perfect person then <laughs> to kick us off here. Can you give us a bit of an overview of the Korean TV landscape? I mean, what I do know is obviously K culture, if you like, is is huge right now, right across the world. But um, focusing specifically on Korean TV, can you take us through like the channels and you know how the how the industry is organised? There were there were three major terrestrial networks, which were KBS, uh, SBS, and NBC. And then in 1990, they they deregulated the South Korean broadcast market, and lots of new channels launched, including lots of the current um, cable channels. So. Um, 2011, they set up uh, JTBC, MBN, TV Chosun, and Channel A. And that created a lot more kind of, uh, obviously, competition uh, for viewers and hit shows. And lots of formats started to appear and K-dramas um, at around that time. And that's, I guess, when they beca- began to become much more sort of qualitatively sort of high in terms of what was coming out of the territory as well as as, as well as quantity. They were at that point exporting through the 2000s, exporting China was the, the primary market that were taking a lot of Korean formats. There was a little hiccup in 2017 when China stopped taking those formats as they had a a falling out over the Thad missile crisis. And Korea realized that, I guess, China couldn't be the sort of um, the, the main place or the only place that they were selling to and started to look outside the country a lot more. So that that was when things started to change in terms of export. But with the channels in general, a lot of the big channels have always had their own in-house production. And that only started to sort of change much more recently. More producers started to set up. And in, I think it was in 1991, they started a, a kind of outsourcing system, a bit like we have in the UK, where they had to have a minimum of, of um, shows coming from outside producers, which sort of stimulated the production landscape, I guess. But so that, that's the sort of the, the kind of broad landscape. But then there's some very kind of particular reasons, I think, why it's become recently such a sort of creative hotbed. Before we get into that, you mentioned indies and there's starting to be a bit of an indie community and indie culture there we did a a, a special on germany a couple of weeks ago and i was surprised to hear that you know still it's about you know broadcasters owning all the rights to to content whereas obviously in the uk we're used to after terms of trade the ability to sell content internationally that is vital for producers and their growth what about korea is can indies own their own IP and, and export them? Well, yeah, that's something that's changed in the last year, in fact, because up until just this year, in fact, it was the, the broadcasters who traditionally held the programme rights. And so pro- independent production studios could really only get their IP if they did some sort of joint project with an overseas partner. But 
I think the government who are wanting to really sort of increase this this international kind of export business realised that that had to be incentivised. So um, now the traditional broadcasters, KBS, NBC, they're moving away from a model where they pay 100% of the production fee to outside suppliers. Um, and they're now starting to pay around sort of more like 60%. So the producers then have to find the remainder, but that means that they in exchange get to keep some international rights. So that I think is going to be a real step change. It's the sort of situation that I think China is very keen to start exporting, but they haven't yet really figured out a, a model to incentivize that independent production in, in the same way. And, and I think that's where what, what, what will make a big difference in Korea, as of course it did in the UK and kind of led to this explosion in, in the indie sector here. Content coming from Korea has had this you know, extraordinary success over the last few years. Formats like Grandpa's Under Flowers and one or two others that have really sort of broken out. And we'll talk to Diane about those in a second. But what do you think is the essence of the Korean content that is leading to this you know, extraordinary success? It's such an interesting study in how a lot of different factors have kind of come together to create this sort of perfect storm, really. But what's unusual is that it has been so sort of consciously done top down. So, as I say, the Korean government set up COCA, which is the Korea Culture and Content Agency in 2001, to actively support Korea's export of culture. And that's across everything. So, that's what they call Hallyu, which is the Korean cultural export wave. It's the word for wave. And it's across everything. So, you know, obviously music, K-pop, everybody's familiar with, but across TV, export of fashion, food, um, in all of those areas. And they have put so much money into supporting that. And they've set up like incubators. Format East is, is one that gets money from Cocker, which is to help creators come up with ideas. But then that has sort of, you know, filtered into this really outward facing, very collaborative model of work. They've tripled this year the budget into supporting um, the country's creative output. And in, in, in TV, that's into kind of co-developments and co-funding projects with international partners. That's the sort of one side of it, which is the sort of top-down government encouragement, which has really worked. But then, you know, as with Israel, it's a very young population. It's an incredibly high-tech, media-savvy population. And so, that does help in general in the kind of innovation of a sort of media output. And then there are sort of other things that feed into it. So, the whole K-pop phenomenon, if you like, has made for a culture which is incredibly sort of engaged, you know, the, the, the K-pop super fan social media around those musicians and artists and, and the sort of TV that surrounds them m makes for this kind of really sticky sort of content that lots of other TV industries around the world would probably kill for. And when it comes to the actual ideas, because I think some of the ideas are kind of quite out there, aren't they, in terms of program, in terms of the formats. And that's actually mm. the reason that many of them are, are working. You know, Masked Singer, for example, and uh, as I say, we'll come on to talk to Diane about, uh, you know, some of the actual format points. Is it a culture, is there a cultural element there mm. that, that, that society thinks and is organised in a different way that leads to these ideas that would never come from the US or the UK or a European program makers? There was a sort of tendency, sort of Japan obviously was the TV culture that, that most people became initially familiar with and, and all of the, as we know them, the, you know, crazy Japanese game shows were where we sort of started to see that very visual to, to us kind of very exotic very colorful style which is some, which is often quite different to to the sort of shows that we produce and and I think Korea learned from that and obviously that some of the culture is the same and I think it is this sort of this highly visual aesthetic which is quite different to a Western aesthetic, but which is great, particularly for family entertainment, for game shows. You know, you see it in Mars Singer, but it's not just about the way that it looks. It's also about just sort of thinking of a show from an entirely different perspective. So a lot of the people that I interviewed for the latest report 
just said that although we've been trying, you know, everybody is always trying to re-engineer the talent show or to think about things in different ways. Probably we would never in a million years have come up with something that kind of looked and felt like the Masked Singer did. Um, I know ITV had their own sort of stars in their eyes reverse show that they were working on. And they said they sort of had the idea, but it just didn't look and feel as different. And I think some of that comes from just the fact that it's backstory, you know, you know, it's come from a different culture. So you, you want that kind of something that feels a bit crazy and different and, and everybody's looking for that. Um, so that helps. But then it's also, I think, to do with the way that shows are produced in Korea. So unlike in the UK and in lots of the Western format developing countries, they are much quicker to get things on air and they change the show and evolve the show when it's on air whereas we like to plan out all the format points and say this will happen here and that's what will happen in episode two uh, and it's just a totally different way of approaching a production so when you get together you know different partners like that with totally different approaches you you, you can create something new well that's really interesting diane bringing you in now for those who don't know cjenm and it used to be CJE and M, didn't it? And it sort of, I think, it re- rebranded a couple of, of years ago. I know it's a huge company. Can you give us a bit of an overview for those who, who are not particularly familiar with, with the business? Sure. Um, first of all, thanks for inviting me to Telecast, Justin. And I'm so glad to be on the show with Claire. I'm Diane Min and CJE and M, and I handle both non scripted and scripted formats. Um, CJ ENM is the one of the biggest media company in Asia. We are both network and studio at the same time. Uh, we have 16 cable networks and we have highest rating share in Korean TV markets. We produce 40 entertainment shows and 25 drama series per year. So we work very closely with Netflix. So you can find many of our scripted shows in Netflix and we have three original shows with Netflix so far, and there are more to come. A very interesting point about CJ ENM is we are both studio and network, and our studio is under network. So we have 300 in-house EPs and showrunners. Right. So we also run more than 10 overseas regional offices in LA, Beijing, Tokyo, Stockholm, Madrid, Istanbul, etc. Do you have any offices in, in the UK? Not or you say Stockholm, obviously, with, with Echo Rights, right? Yeah, correct. You know, the business has, has really become, you know, raised its profile on the international industry landscape on the back of, you know, some, some really strong performances by some of your international format sales. So can you take us through your biggest shows? Yes, of course. Um, it's definitely I Can See Your Voice for Now. Episode one just premiered on Fox last week and it scored number one rating in 18 to 49 demo. Also, it was highest rated for debut in last three years ever since Ellen's Game of Games. Also, I have to say about Grandpa Over Flower, as you mentioned, as known as Better Late Than Never. So ever since the US premiere, we had um, nine commissions globally. And then, you know, due to pandemic, um, none of show is on production right now, but hopefully that we have many of them back next year. Grandpa's Over Flowers was better late than never. Yes. And yeah, in the US, I suppose that was the one that really sort of brought the format to the international TV audience's attention. And that was a remake with, I think, was it William Shatner and Henry Winkler? Yes. Fantastic show. And that was back in... That's about four years, four or five years ago, right? Yeah, 2016. Right, okay. And that's gone to, did you say nine or ten territories now? Yes, it's with nine territories so far. No, it's ten territories. Ten territories. Okay, yes. fantastic. Well, well, congratulations on that, and that hopefully will we'll, uh, we'll keep on rolling. And, yeah, so I can see your voice just debuted on Fox, as you say, which is, is, is a really strong start. So congratulations on on that i think bbc one has also commissioned that yes we got commission only this year and then we are working on pre-production and then if everything goes smooth the production will start this year and is it just the uk and the us at the moment in terms of international remakes 
Uh, no more than that. We have 12 commissions so far. 12, wow. Yes. And then the, uh, we just had the German version in August. We just shoot Dutch, uh, the Holland version last week. Uh huh. And it's coming in October. Okay. And this is a singing competition show. Uh-huh. Can you just briefly take us through it? I mean, hopefully we'll have some video clips that we'll be able to post in the uh, in the description of the podcast so everybody can have a look at trailers or, or maybe some clips from the Fox show. Can you just take us briefly through the format and why you think it's being so successful? Sure. Uh, so this is the singing show, which you cannot hear contestants' real voice at the end of the show. So every episode, we have seven contestant singers and one celebrity with host and panels. So celebrity detectives have to identify who's the good singer or best singer based on their lip sync, look, and investigations. So it's lip syncing. You've got to guess who's lip syncing and who isn't. Yes. Right. So it's definitely a singing show, but we think this is more close to the game show. Mm. So you can play along at home watching the show. It's really easy and fun. Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, it sounds like the, you know, the, this this general fun game show, singing show, getting everybody around the TV again in these times when everybody needs a little bit of color and fun and uh, lightheartedness. I think it's obviously the... Uh, it's it's really hitting at, at the right time as well as it obviously being a, uh, a really inventive format. Yeah, we all need some fun. And I think that I Can Your Voice is definitely something that everyone needs right now. And then I would like to share four reasons why I Can Your Voice is so distinctive from many other formats. Mm. So first one is originality. So there are so many singing shows that selects the good singer but I think this is the only singing show that even the bad singer can win. Right. This is very fun twist, and it makes the show very unique. I and need to put myself uh-huh. on this show. This is uh, <laughs> this, uh, It sounds like I'm in with a chance. Yes, BBC One, I think they just announced the applicant, so you can definitely <laughs> apply. Excellent. Right. I shall. As soon as we're yes. finished on this recording, I'm putting my application in. Oh, yes, please, please do. <laughs> So also, I think the second one is universality. You know, due to different demo or due to violence or provocative scenes, there are not many shows that family can watch together. Mm. But this is a show that you can bring to the dinner table and talk with your parents, friends, with, you know, everyone. Yeah. Also, the third one is the adaptability. So, you know, we have like 12 commission so far and it's so easy to adapt and when i see all the different international versions there are not much changes Hmm. so the only reason that they change is due to the duration so sometimes they have more contestants or more rounds that's it and then the last one is enjoyability you know most of singing show the only one winner throughout the whole season will be win and the other hundred contestants are not even remembered but this show, whoever wins, it's so funny. And, you know, these days also the artist booking is so difficult, but the most of the celebrity who came to this show as a panel, as a detective, you know, they want to come back mm. because they had just so much fun. So they really want to come back on this show. Okay. So I think those are the four reasons that the I Can Your Voice has been had great success from many countries so far. Yeah, I was going to say, I think the interesting thing, what, what Diane said as well about the, the, the kind of hybrid nature of it, and obviously this was the same with, with The Masked Singer, and I think that's what Korea are doing particularly well at the moment. I mean, sometimes hybrid shows, it's kind of a bit of a, a development classic of like, yeah, let's mash up some genres, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But I think Korea have been you know, doing really well in, in, in this kind of mixing talent with game show or sometimes, you know, mixing variety and dating or whatever. And it's this, uh, it's kind of clashing things together, but but creating, especially around these shows, 
that sort of social media engagement. If you watch Mars Singer and you're not on Twitter trying to work out if, you know, the tree is Peter Crouch or whatever, then you're sort of missing half the show. And that's kind of what what, what is so integral to to a lot of the shows that, that they are producing. It's that play along. It's the, you know, discussing with your family or with whoever it is on social media who, who is who it is or can they sing or can't they sing. And, um, you know, that, that that's, I think, a, the secret to a lot of their success. Yeah, it's a bit of a social connector. Yeah, both in your own home and uh, and on on social media. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. I think the mask singer was very special because you know these days, especially the young people, they don't watch the television. But I think the mask singer really bring every generation onto the television because you know this is something that you don't want to miss. You really want to know who's the winner in the same time. You don't want to be you know. So I think this is the show really bring everyone onto television again. Mm -hmm. The final or finale, should I say, of of this competition is that you could have a real singer or somebody who can really sing incredibly well versus somebody who, like me, is, you know, is is kind of useless. But what I got from the US version is that even the guys that can't sing, I mean, they really go for it, right? They really, really mm-hmm. go for the performance. And even that, you know, the worse it is, maybe the better it is. Yes. I'm fascinated to see how it uh, how it performs in the UK. And can you just tell us in, uh, on the Fox version, who's the talent involved? Our host is Ken Jung. Uh-huh. And he's also the EP. We have the celebrity singer every week. Yeah. Yeah, and then we do have a two panelists in every episode, and then we have two or three the different panelists of celebrities every week. So that's uh, I can see your voice. I gather there's also another singing format that you've got in development called Love at First Song, Diane. Can you tell us a bit about that one? Yes, I believe this will be the next I can see your voice. You know, as Claire just mentioned, this is also another hybrid show between dating and singing. So we have 10 couples start, and then the very first round, they practice the duet song without singing each other. So in the first duet, this is their first time to see each other. So we were very thrilled when June Legend got on board last year for the U.S. version. So we were developing U.S. version right now, but it's moving very slow right now due to pandemic. Mm. So other than Korea in Asia, we are also still producing for Malaysia and Vietnam and pre-productions in a couple other territories. Okay. Like For example, in Malaysia, we had in the very first season, we had two married couple. So they quoted it as the most successful dating show in Malaysia. Wow. And that show was already been in production in in Korea, I assume? Yes. For a number of seasons? This show started as a paper format. Right. So we had the Vietnamese version first, and then we just had the Korean version last year. So we haven't decided, you know, the season two hasn't been commissioned, but, you know, it's just last year, so we will keep developing in Korea as well. I see. Okay. And which is the network in the US that's taken Love at First Song? I cannot tell, but we got a development order, but still, you know, we haven't announced yet. Aha. Uh-huh. Okay. And it's very slow. So. Okay. You're not going to disclose it. However much I ask, <laughs> Diane, you're not going to tell me, are you? No, I, I, I wish I could, but you know, I can't <laughs> right now. But you will be the very first one to know. Ah, right. Okay. Now you've promised me that. We'll have you back on the show, Diane, if you'll come back and you can reveal (laughs) who the US network is. Fantastic. Okay, Diane, now it's time for Story of the Week. Can you tell us what you saw in the international TV industry's news this week that caught your eye? Yes. um, Last week, BTS, the Korea boy band, had a speech at the 75th UN General Assembly to send out the message of love myself to encourage the youth in this difficult time due to pandemic. In a seven-minute long video, they encourage young people to do what's most important, love yourself. The message they've been sharing for years, to break free from, disappear, and support one another in warm solidarity. You know, they deliver simple 
but very powerful message. So I highly recommend to check out their UN speech on YouTube. Okay, great. Well, we'll post a link to that again in the episode description so everyone can see that. And it just goes to show, actually, doesn't it, how influential K-culture has become with a, a Korean boy band addressing the UN General Assembly. I mean, two, three years ago, you would never imagine that would happen. As someone said um, this year, in the last year, they've had, I mean, Korea have had the Oscar winning film of the year, the biggest band, BTS, and then the biggest show, Mars Singer. So, you know, it's really, it's really been a hugely successful time. Yeah, extraordinary. Yeah, it has been a really exciting year. And then the Parasite is CJ ENM's film. So we are more thrilled as well. And a, and a good pandemic, if you can say such a thing. Yes, yeah, well. <laughs> Reasonable. Diane, you're right at the centre of that, being the head of formats for CJ, you know, and that must be, must be a really exciting time to do your job. It is. You know, like due to pandemic, you know, they, it's really, really difficult. And that because the broadcaster, even including CJ, E&M, the broadcasters are not picking up the new shows. Mm. But amazingly, I can see your voice. It's going well. And then especially after the U.S. announcement, we have a great progress in each country. So we are very excited. Yeah. Congratulations on that. that that's that's fantastic. I think I'm right in saying that Korea is the country of honor at MIPCOM, even though obviously MIPCOM is not happening in physical form. MIPCOM Online Plus is happening. You were involved in, in MIPCOM in any way? Yes, of course. I have a conference about the Korean formats. I will yeah, definitely talk about I Can See Your Voice. And there are many conferences and the, some workshops about Korea culture and the Korea productions. So you will get some emails to participate in conferences and then meet the Korean producers via online platforms. All right. Okay, well, uh, that's fascinating. We'll be we'll be tuning into that. And I think I'm recording another showcase of Korean formats on Wednesday for uh, MIPCOM as well. So there's, I think, there's three three lots of six formats. Uh, uh, I think six unscripted. No, no, sorry, twelve unscripted and six scripted wow. that are being showcased in that okay. as well. Great. All right. Well, if you want to know more about Korea and Korean formats, that's obviously going to be the place to go. Claire, so now I want to hear about your story of the week. What caught your eye this week? Well, I think mine's a bit um, darker than Diane's. I feel bad now. <laughs> She's sort of uplifting with BTS's a message of hope. Mine, mine, mine is sadly Trump related, and um, I, I guess it's a sort of another big week with the presidential debates. And then I, uh, I was, uh, I was hearing them talk. Uh, Aaron Sorkin talking on the radio this morning about the film that he's done, um, Trial of the Chicago Seven, which is sort of paralleling the riots at the uh, 1968 Chicago Democratic Convention with what's happening now. And then um, also this week, the film, um, The Comey Rule, that's, or the, sorry, the series that's come out on Showtime, The Comey Rule, uh, about the battle between um, FBI director James Comey and, and Donald Trump and the uh, Russian election meddling. But I, I, I sort of read an interesting interview about the drama and how everybody involved, um, the, the writer and director of that, um, Billy Ray, I think, was saying that, you know, they pushed and pushed to get the drama aired um, before the election and got everybody on board. And it's got big names, Jeff Daniels um, as Comey and Brendan Gleeson as Trump. But they uh, were told at one point, oh, no, it's going to go out in January. Um, and there was some speculation as to whether the sort of Viacom had been leaned on by Donald Trump to do that. Um, and but but instead, luckily, it is it is going out. Uh, it did go out this week. But I, I just thought it was such an interesting um, kind of area. How you know drama is now being turned around so quickly to reflect kind of current situations. And there was lots of sort of iffy reviews about whether it was it was great or not. But this sort of also this idea that you know can a drama be influential in the lead up to an election in the same way that we have all these rules around impartiality and in news and and current affairs but that um 
you know, these these sort of stories from our very recent history are now being told so quickly and with so much at stake, you know, how influential might they be? Or or perhaps no Trump voters are watching Showtime, I don't know. But um. <laughs> Well, no, it, it is fascinating, you know, that, that social media and international influence on elections. Previously, it's really been about unscripted, hasn't it? It's about, you know, exposés, about documentaries, you know, uh, being released around the times of, uh, of elections. But now it's it's obviously moving into scripted as well. And that's that's something that Gertz Lises has been highlighting over the last few yeah. weeks on the show is, you know, is this blurring of the lines? It's definitely a very strong trend that we're seeing now and i'd be fascinated to see uh see what the reaction mm, to that yeah. to that show is reaction has been mixed and it's this question of whether you know some history can be told too soon it's still too kind of raw maybe for the people involved or for the people who take one side of it or the other that it's very difficult to get it kind of right in the moment but it's sort of it's a brave thing to do yeah well, it's going to be really interesting to see what other shows are, are going to be coming out over the next few weeks and, you know, whether or not they have any sort of influence on, on the outcome of this, uh, this very important election. So now it's that time in the show where our guests get to nominate their hero of the week and who or what they want to throw in the bin. Diane, I'm going to come to you now. And I know you were slightly... You didn't really want to throw anything in the bin. I know that, and that but I hope you have got a bin for me. Let, let's start positively. Yes. Tell us your hero of the week. Yes, my hero of the week is Ken Jang. You know, he's the host of I Can See Your Voice. And he's just so perfect as the host for the I Can See Your Voice. You know, it is very different from his judge role from the Masked Singer. As one of the judges of Masked Singer, he shared the moments with fellow judges. But for I Can See Your Voice, he did an amazing job as a host who led the show for 45 minutes. With his great humor, he makes the show very enjoyable. Also, he really puts the tension in each elimination, which really keeps the audience to watch the show, even with seven commercial breaks. Also, he becomes very emotional with contestants and support and help the contestant to win and get the prize money. So I cannot think of anyone other than in a better host for I Can See Your Voice. And I'm so grateful that he got the role for I Can See Your Voice. Yeah, yeah. well, he's he's having a moment as well, isn't he, really, in terms of... Yes. They're calling it Ken, Ken's Day in uh, in the US now because yes. he's on, on, on a Wednesday. He's always on something. Ken's Day, <laughs> fantastic. Oh, that's a great one. I, I, uh, I look forward to seeing, uh, seeing his performance on the show. And Diane, who or what are you telling to get in the bin? Oh, yeah, for the get in the bin, it's definitely COVID-19. Actually, Mm. I cannot tell, but two Mm. of my shows are cancelled in states in the pandemic. And eight productions are all on hold globally due to COVID-19. Also, I really miss my nonstop flying life, for which I can't due to COVID-19. On an average year, I mean, how many flights would you tend to take? I think average 10 to 12. Right. Okay. Per year. Right. And then like sometimes I do go to like two different cities a month. So there was a one time I was in different time zone in every week in a month. So I was in like Madrid, Seoul, and Los Angeles and Seoul. Right. I don't know if anyone else saw there was a story in the paper this weekend about how I think it was particularly in Taiwan, but in 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 quite a few places in Asia, um, airlines are offering flights just for people to fly around who are missing being able to 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 fly because they they're not actually going anywhere, but there are people who are missing flying so much that they're just going up in a plane, going around and coming back. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yes. You know what? I, yeah, that's definitely Taiwan. And they visited the one of island in Korea. Right. So they couldn't take off. They just came in. And then I think, yeah, they enjoyed being in the air and then they came back. <laughs> <laughs> that is the most 2020 thing I think I've heard. Uh, yes. I can't yes. I can't necessarily can't see anybody in the UK doing that necessarily. I mean it's you know such a challenge even getting onto the plane if you leave on time. Yes. But there we are. Well Diane, well I hope you're enjoying your rest, I suppose, right? Being in one place 
for an enforced amount of time. It sounds like you've got catching up of your sleep to to do before it all. Uh, hopefully, uh, we're, we're all allowed to uh, to start doing international business and international travel again. Claire, how about you? Who's your hero of the week? Uh, well, my hero of the week is I think he's called Magawa, who is the mine detecting rat uh, who was sniffing out mines, and he made a lot of news programs uh, at the end of last week. I think everybody was just yeah. so happy to have a kind of a fun, good news story of a rat wearing a medal alongside all the bad news, and uh, and then f- there was that was quickly followed up by the story about all the dogs that are being trained to sniff out COVID. So it, it made me think a couple of things. Firstly, uh, wouldn't it be great if we could train animals to sniff out good formats. I don't know what a good format would smell like, but mm. that would be very mm. helpful. Uh, and then also that we've we've had so many dog formats. I've written about them quite a few times um, for K7 in the last year, but I think it's about time that we feature some other animals. We did get a request this week from someone who wanted to know um, about cat formats. So that always you know <laughs> makes me happy when the balance is, is uh, readjusted. And uh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, other other animals with um, the, with these sorts of t- talents whether it's sniffing or otherwise i think um it's their time has come what do you think diane is that a <laughs> format that could could travel rat based digging <laughs> format <laughs> you know maybe we can make a round out of it maybe we can give them like yeah. headphones and then they can listen the rear voice of the content yeah. of the bike, your voice and then we yeah. look at their faces Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Brilliant. Brilliant. Sniff out a good singer. We need to play this back to Frapper so they know where exactly this format originated. So. Uh, yeah. Yes. Definitely. <laughs> we'll split right. it, Diane. Diane <laughs> yeah. And Claire, thank you so much for coming on Telecast this week. I've really enjoyed our chat. Learned a lot about a Korean TV industry, which is fantastic. We'll put all of the links to those stories and those shows in the episode description so everybody can go and uh, go and check out all of those clips we look forward to seeing you both very soon thank you justin bye thanks Justin. bye well we've reached the end of this week's show thanks for listening please rate and subscribe to the show and share it with friends and colleagues if you want to hear more about our advertising and sponsorship packages please email justin at boomdialogue.com. That's justin at boomdialogue.com. This week's telecast was sponsored by prbuzz.tv. Telecast was edited by Ian Chambers. Next week, we're looking at the true crime genre with two of the TV industry's leaders in this field. So until then, as always, stay safe.